Welcome, um, everybody, back here to um, Siegel Talks at the Martin Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY here at City University in Manhattan in New York City. And uh, uh, another week on uh, uh, planet Earth and the time of Corona is coming uh, slowly um, to an end. What a week uh, it was and still is. Uh, um, of course, you know, the demonstrations, the Black Lives Matter, the funeral of George Floyd, um, now over 2 million infected people in this corona confirmed cases. Who knows what the real numbers is? They might be double and more. Um, the next country, you know, with 700,000 is Brazil. And then the next one is, uh, I think, 300,000 or 200,000 in Italy. So we are really in dire straits. And New York is slowly opening, slowly reopening. We're trying out um, how, how life uh, feels. Uh, everybody hopes we will not go back to normal, what it was. There has to be a new normal. Things have to change, should change, perhaps have already changed. And uh, theater artists always, as we so often say here, have been on the right side of history, on the right side of uh, the struggle, on the complex struggle for freedoms and liberties and uh, had their pulse on what's right and what we should be doing. And they look also in the future, anticipate the future, shape the future and um, are always, always in the present and also make us aware and tell us stories that are more complex than just the photo or the, the clip. So it really makes us aware that there's a whole life we talk about and the, and the, um, the universe. Yesterday we had uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, a significant French uh, philosopher here. First time we went a little bit outside, we will do that more. We talked about uh, Corona, the time of Corona in theater and uh, the aging population who's come out, but also kind of the tragic times we live in and that the hero is someone who has a destin on a destination, but we wander around, we get lost. We don't know what the truth really is. Philosophy is, is, you know, is something where we do not know one truth, if that's a truth. And there are many of them and theater always has helped us to look at the same thing from different sides and understand the, understand the complexities of life. Um, we had uh, a National Black Theater with us uh, on Monday. We had um, um, James Scruggs and uh, Tamila Woodard with us, very um, important session. And today we have uh, another uh, significant young theater artist, I think, uh, from, uh, from here, working here in New York City, Avoye Tempo with us. Um, Avoye, so really thank you so much uh, for um, for joining, where are you? And normally I say what time it is, but uh, we'll probably <laughs> share the time zone. Yeah, exactly, yes. I'm, uh, first of all, Frank, I'm so happy to see you. It's so great to be here with you. Um, I'm here in my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, and, you know, as I was saying, my, my computer died just before we kind of went into lockdown. So I'm on my iPad. So if you see me looking away from the camera, it's because I'm, I'm on my iPad and not on my laptop. <laughs> yeah, but it looks, it looks very, very, uh, very good. So it was not a computer virus or was it a computer virus? Do you know? No, what? I've computers since like 2007. I'm shocked it has lasted this long. And it just said, yeah. okay, time for something new, just like yeah. everything else right now. <laughs> so what neighborhood are you in in Brooklyn? How does it look like when you go outside to the street? So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's changed. I live in, um, in Prospect Heights, not far from the Brooklyn Museum. Um, so I'm kind of right in between Prospect Heights and Crown Heights. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I feel like it's kind of evolved. You know, the first couple of weeks was very much, um, very few people out and about. Um, and over the past couple of weeks, you know, people kind of having a growing comfortability with being around other people. And then certainly with the um, protests happening in the past two weeks, I feel like that has totally changed the energy and dynamic of the neighborhood. Um, I've walked around a bunch of parts of Brooklyn in the past couple of weeks. And um, yeah, I think, you know, in, in relationship to the coronavirus people, you know, now that the kind of um, social kind of the, the, the distance breach, the distance pact has kind of been breached in order to protest, um, it's definitely changed the energy in the streets and people are, I think, starting to think even more about, okay, what is our next chapter going to be and you can 100% feel that energy in the streets and I think some of the some of the fear um, that kind of occupied people's minds and bodies in the early part is still present and some is um, um, about how can we 
um, what, what are the things that need to be done right now that we can't even carry that beer with us as we go outside. So it's, it's, it's just, it's so interesting. Every, every week has been its own adventure, has had its own energy, has had its own feelings, had its own momentum. Um, so yeah, but that's, that's what it, that's what it, that's what it feels like. For how many weeks, weeks are you in confinement? Are you in lockdown? Do you know what? I think this must be going into three into three months. Yeah, I think probably next week will be three months. Um, yeah, I, I I was out of town working on a show when um, when the um, all the shelter at home, shelter in place orders went into effect. So um, you know, we we stopped. Um, we were in tech for a show. So Where we were you? Ended up, I was out in Berkeley. I was in Berkeley at Berkeley Rep. Um, and we were doing Jocelyn Bio's School Girls. Um, and we were in, yes, we were in tech. And we managed to do a run through in tech, film a performance, and then we sent everybody home. So then I came back to New York and have been here in my apartment for the past three months. So it's hard to believe that amount of That's time incredible. has passed. Yeah. Three so months. Back and like an eternity at the same time. I know everybody's feeling that. Hmm. So did you stay mostly at home? Did you? Uh obey the curfews and all of it and yeah I was I was mostly at home I, you know it was funny because um you know like so many um artists there's so many times like I don't actually spend that much time at home I barely spend any time <laughs> in my apartment I'm oftentimes out of the city so um you know at first it was just a matter of just getting acclimated to saying oh I actually live in my apartment I should you know organize it and clean it and you know make it habitable um and then just kind of settled into be being inside and kind of being hunkered down on the inside and feeling, you know, watching the world kind of um, crumble and just watching the death tolls all around the world just click up all around the world. It's been such, I know for everybody, such a surreal, um, surreal, surreal um, experience being inside. But yeah, it's um, so also kind of the explosion now into the streets is really quite um, something, but also so inevitable. I mean, from, we've been, watching from inside our house houses and watching a government kind of bungle a, a huge pandemic um, and living inside with all the frustrations and anger of that, the sadness of that, like we're sitting inside and we're mourning people's lives and, you know, the energy that we spend looking in on each other and checking up on each other, you know, um, it's been, um, it's been um, exhausting and so, in so many um, in so many ways. And so then on top of that, to have the deaths of Breonna Taylor and then Ahmaud Arbery and Tony McDade and George Floyd and the countless others who, whose lives have been taken away, I feel like it, it's just recognizing that even in a pandemic, like what a priority racism is in this country, um, that even when everything is, everything is meant to shut down, immediately from the beginning, we're having conversations about what does it mean to be an essential worker? Who are those people? How are they getting paid? It's like when, when everything stops, racism still prevails. And that is a really, um, that's something that we're just all witnessing in real time all together right now. So yeah, it's a very interesting moment. Mm. Did you join the protest or what decision do you make? Because you have to think, do I get potentially Corona or not? Do I protect myself, my family? Do I go out? Yeah, no, it's it's such a big question. And, you know, I, I unfortunately have some health issues that mean that I'm not able to kind of be outside amongst people. But, um, you know, I've been finding ways to protest from inside, to send letters and sign petitions and make phone calls and send emails and get other people um, on board and continue just learning and reading myself about all the different um, kind of um, actions that there that there are to take, but definitely have been um, mobilizing from from inside, you know. Hmm. So, how did you spend the three months in, in as an artist, as a really as a, as a working artist, a working director? What did, how did mm -hmm. how what how did you spend your days? You know, it was so interesting. Um, the first couple of weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, the first couple of weeks were really, as I say, about just figuring out what it means to, I mean, to reorganize all the energies and vibrations of your life into 
a space and I'm here by myself in the apartment. And so just organize, just finding a way to kind of like be present and still inside of my apartment was, um, you know, a little bit of, it took a little bit of adjustment, making sure I've got my groceries and making, you know, just making sure that I could just live inside of in, inside of this place and set it up to be as safe and as healthy as possible. Um, so that that really took a couple of weeks. And also I feel like the first couple of weeks was just checking in with people everywhere, just like calling family and friends in different parts of the world and just saying, how are you? What's going on where you are? Are you safe? Are you healthy? Do you need anything? How is your family? You know, I think it was just like a moment of, <clears throat> excuse me, just connection with people. Um, and then over the course of the next I would say two months. Um, the thing that the thing that I put in my brain pretty early was that, you know, the the institutions, the buildings in which we create, um, are closed, and so the the way that we create is also um, at a little bit of a standstill. But even through that, that we ourselves as artists are still standing strong and hopefully can kind of continue to take care of each other health wise so that everybody can remain healthy, you know, through throughout the rest of this um, pandemic. But I think having I, the, the, I put myself in a mindset of the institute, the buildings are closed, the institutions are closed, but we as artists are alive and well and strong and healthy. Um, and so um, I I found a lot of um, freedom in that, that even though we are not able to gather, which is such an essential part of the work that we do, um, I said, okay, what are the things that, um, you know, there's, there's a number of things that we as artists, certainly us as directors do in isolation that we do without other people, whether that is, um, reading or researching or just talking to people, just living, you know? So I said, let me just um, kind of focus on those things, the things of just life um, and know and appreciate that that is part of, um, you know, our kind of preparation and work as people um, in addition to as artists. And there were sometimes I will definitely admit, I was like, I do not feel like reading anything. I don't feel like writing anything. It was very difficult to focus. Um, but then I also feel grateful that there's a couple of other um, projects that I had been working on that we said, you know what, let's keep, let's keep working. Um, let's keep developing. Let's keep, um, you know, at some point we will be able to um, gather again. We'll be able to be in the same space again. We'll be able to create together again. But in the meantime, um, in the places where we could, let's keep, let's keep working. So there's a musical that had been um, developing and we still have of meetings and just get together and kind of keep the momentum of that going forward. Um, you know, other projects that were kind of in, in early stages and we said, let's keep going. Let's have, let's meet regularly. Let's work on the script. Let's work on the dramaturgy. Let's do research. Um, and um, there's some other audio kind of related projects that we've been able to kind of continue um, working on. So I, I felt, um, I, I figured for myself maybe a couple weeks in that it would be helpful to set a routine for myself in the day um, uh, so that I didn't feel like I was wandering. Um, and that was incredibly helpful for me. So I feel, I feel like I've been able to um, kind of keep busy and also really figure out how to um, just stay present. Because I think my, for, certainly for myself, and I'm sure for so many other people, we're always, you know, trying to think of the things we're gonna be doing in a year from now and six months from now and just having to say, okay, actually like we literally don't know what tomorrow is gonna to be like. I feel that same way today. Um, like just kind of learning and figuring out how to just remain, both remain present in the moment and then also think about what do we want the future to look like when we when we if let's say we go back and there are things that do look the same how do we want to exist inside of that and also where are the places that we want to kind of see how the entire structure and model and methods of how we make theater um, can um, stretch and grow and be different because you know the thing that we talk about a lot is what does it mean for us to be inside of a model of theater that is, you know, 50, 60, 70 years old? What do we want the next 50 years to be? And I think that, you know, that conversation that kind of got opened up 
oh, oh, you know, over the course of the early days of the pandemic, certainly um, in other industries, now we're having that conversation globally about, um, you know, race and racism and what do we, what will it mean for us to actually finally have this conversation and this kind of national reckoning about what slavery is and how it continues to pervade every single morsel of our um, daily lives and what are we going to be willing to do to uproot that system so that we can make a pathway for something um, for something new for something better for something equal for something just you know um, so it's been I, I, I feel it, it it's so tragic that it took us to be in the middle of the pandemic in order to be able to have this conversation at this level. Um, but I feel that, um, yeah, it feels, it feels necessary and essential in terms of how we think about moving forward. Mm. So you felt that conversation never happened inside the theater before? I think that conversation happens in the theater um, Frequently, I think people have the conversation about um, how do we, you know, I think that um, artists of color, black artists as well have put um, the theaters um, in check and said, hey, um, why don't you have more black plays on your stages? Why don't you have more people of color working on your staffs? Where is your audience of color? Like we, we have that conversation very, very, very frequently. And it has manifested kind of minor adjustments and changes, but at the level of transformation that is actually required, I feel like people saying this, how we are, you know, the conversation is going around like the police department, like, are we gonna make a reform inside of the, the police department or do we get rid of the police departments entirely and build a new system? And I think that, you know, the theaters have been having a conversation that is about about, um, making kind of um, incremental small changes and also that the logic of that change is um, you know I think very oftentimes the theaters particularly the predominantly white theaters saying that you know they want to I think sometimes they think that they're like doing black people and people of color a favor by you know by producing the work of black people as if they are not as if they, and, and in a way not recognizing the kind of greatness and the power of black artists and artists of color um, who are coming into those institutions and ultimately making those institutions better because we're expanding and stretching what the notion of a play is and all of those kinds of things inside of those institutions. But I feel like, you know, as a director, we um, deal with so many different kind of facets of what how the theater is structured we're dealing with the board members we're dealing with the development office we're dealing with the marketing we're dealing with the audience we're dealing with the casting we're dealing you know it's like at every single level there is some sort of racist structure in place and um i think hopefully now will be the time where we can have that conversation about what is what is the american theater actually and on whose backs have some of these theaters been able to um create their um, prosperity and how have they been able to do that. So I, I feel like that is kind of for us the next chapter of the, the conversation on a very big level, not an incremental small level, because that I think we have seen before and been doing already. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. How, how was for you, if I may ask, Aboya, um, the experience? You know, it's so hard to break the theater business for anyone. It's so hard if you're a woman, I think, probably here. I mean, we work with the League um, of American Women in Theater, and um, we, we know the numbers have actually been going down um, as compared to 20 years ago. But you're also, you know, an artist of color, a Black director, young. How, how was your experience, or how is that? Yeah, well, you know, it works. I think it's um, it's trying to think of a clear way to describe it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let me I'll start. I'll kind of rewind a little bit. Um, you know, when I was coming up, you know, I probably started doing theater when I was, uh, and I'm sure I've told you this story before. But um, coming up doing theater, I grew up in New Jersey, um, and um, 
ended up going to college in Ohio. Um, and when I was coming up, I was actually always so excited and intrigued by the, um, you know, the absurdists and the existentialists, because I felt like their depiction of what the world was, was so um, on point. It just, just, it just resonated with me, the way that they were thinking, like articulating and expressing how the world looks and how it feels. Um, that work felt the most true to me. Um, and so, um, you know, my work in those early days was kind of centered in that, um, in that vocabulary. Um, and, you know, as I say often, you know, the, um, even going to school in Ohio, getting a degree in theater, um, it's, you know, I think so much about all the distorted ways that um, our all the distorted ways that we're taught history and taught about who we are um, from the time that we're very, very young. I've, I've said, you know, I, even when I was in um, college, let's say just in, in the theater realm, if I'm, when I was in college, I don't think I read any play by a black playwright. So what did I then learn about what actual American theater history is? It means that I actually didn't learn American theater history, even though that's what they told me they were teaching me. They didn't teach me about um, um, you know, um, Alice Childress. They didn't teach me about Wally Soyinka. They didn't teach me about rit ritual traditions and practices, but they, but I have a degree in theater that has meant to teach me what, what theater is and what our history is. And if you think about even our kind of education system and what we learn the civil rights movement was when we learned slavery and it's like we've just been just told lies about who we are as people for so 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 long so i bring that up to kind of connect it to the path as a director in theater because in in a way it's kind of in two portions one you know on a way 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 larger scale I think, you know, what we think of as the American theater, and you can probably speak to this way better than I can, is um, in a way of kind of a narrow window into what the possibility and capacity of theater, the vocabulary, the history, et cetera, is at all. Um, but in addition, when I was first starting out, you know, I, I graduated from college in 2000. So when I was coming out, the, the black artists who were kind of the most prominent in, um, in New York, um, I got to New York in 2003, um, were, you know, George Wolf was around, Susan Laurie, Anna DeVere. <clears throat> um, and so I've kind of been able to watch the evolution of black artists inside of white institutions, but, uh, you know, originally did not have much of voca a vocabulary or understanding of also the black institutions that had been created, the New York Ensemble Companies, the Classical Theater Parliaments, the National Black Theater. And um, so as I kind of continued on my own directing journey, um, really the places that I was able to um, work and find my own voice as a, as a director were through either independently produced um, pieces or um, you know, I think significantly through the support of the National Black Theater and, you know, and being able to see and witness also that the, the, the way that the theaters of color felt so isolated from what we consider to be the American theater, it really gave a perspective in terms of um, who, who does the American theater value and respect and who do they say is worthy of being inside of their, um, of their um, institutions. And I had also been inside of those institutions, assistant directing on a bunch of plays at, at, different, at different places. So I could see the kind of um, um, this discrepancy, you know? Um, and so for me, I feel, I feel so um, grateful and, and really indebted to um, places like NBT for, for existing, for having that space for us as black artists to be able to create. And then what happens is, you know, the, then, you know, you might work on something and um, be able to kind of have access into, um, into the white institution. But even that journey, I always say, it's like, you have to have an army of people. It's not about talent. It's not about anything that anybody's going to tell you that it's about. Like you have to know something, people have to see your work. Like that's all complete nonsense. It's really the army that it takes to um, 
be able to um, push your and claw your way um, into the white institutions is very um, it's very challenging. And you know, I feel I, I like I have, have an army, a literal army of people who were able to help me kind of make those transitions. So um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely not been an easy process. And now, um, you know, I think one of the things that I try to do is make sure, and especially, you know, thankfully we as directors can do this, make sure that um, once we are um, working, once we are working inside of those white institutions, thinking about what are the different ways that we can um, maneuver and also transform um, things from the inside in collaboration oftentimes with other people of color who are on staff or other people, other white colleagues who are kind of on the same page um, and making sure that the, we can bring in designers of color, making sure that we're thinking about what's the marketing, as I said before, what's the marketing of the show? How are we connecting to the audience? Who's in the audience? You know, these are all things that we, um, it's, they're just constant, constant, um, battles and and fights so it's yeah it's it's been a it's been a journey it's been a fight and the fight continues mm -hmm. um you said you were an assistant director not what you said the white theater institution how was that experience how did you feel would you feel um you, they said well, it's great to have you here or something you have to be thankful or you felt that it was a fair chance but how was the atmosphere for you you know, it's so interesting. Um, so, and um, when did I do this? It must have been 2007, 2008. Um, I was a directing fellow at the public. And the great thing about the shows that I worked on was that they, um, they were mostly, I'm trying to think back now, um, you know, I, I assisted on the brother's size, Terrell's play, um, there was um, another great play by Naomi Wallace that had all uh, fully Middle Eastern Persian cast. Um, um, you know, thankfully, uh, some of those plays were kind of you're around, you know, other people of color. And so that kind of um, was really um, beautiful. But you're definitely looking and it's, it's not exclusive to the public. It's theaters all over the country. You're mostly walking into places where most of the staff is white, most of the um, production team is white. It's a, it's a white institution. So, um, you know, it's interesting going and working at a place like the National Black Theater um, where, you know, the production manager, like everybody on the staff is um, in, in support and in connection to who you are. So the, 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 the challenges are just, it's a different, um, it's a different fight. There's some things you don't have to think about because you know that there are producers there who, um, who are really looking out for you and who really um, love you and respect you and want the, want the best for you. So the, the experience is definitely um, um, different, you know? And, then, and that, was, that was 15 years ago almost, maybe, no, 13, 12, 13 years ago. Um, but that's still, it's still the same. I mean, we work at theaters all across the country. They still, there, there have been progress, been progress for sure, but the theaters for the most part still look the same. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, that, that kind of, and at the end of the day, it's like that, the, the, the echo of the protests from um, Minneapolis all across the country that, you know, I can hear sitting here in my apartment sometimes, um, you know, it's all kind of talking about the same um, thing. It's like, what, what, what are the places that um, anti-blackness is just has pervaded every single morsel of our society and the theater world is just not exempt from that from that there's been letters coming out from people in the food world and the publishing world you know and all different companies um all echoing you know this this cry that's coming out of of, of minneapolis and out of louisville and alabama you know all the all the places where um these these stories are so um that that is the at the end of the day that's that's kind of like the primary cry is just it's just not the entire system of everything of everything everything is just so completely skewered and unjust and so i think i i i am appreciative that um and you know and people are gathering in different ways to be able to kind of make the transformations on the on the highest level, meaning like in inside of you know, it, the, it, meaning the, the things that we're watching on television every single day, but also kind of taking the moment to assess in every facet of our own lives where that is also replicated. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let's say, you know, no, no, let's say about <coughs> could change, but what, what do you think has to change? What do you think, what are, what, what are things that need obvious things, what needs to change? You mean in, um, in theater, in the world? In... Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe we, 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 start, we start with theater, you know, but in these institutions you go in, because I'm sure also for, it's an honest moment, I think, also for these institutions. And they say, what, you know, what, what do we, what can we do? Because they didn't see the world the way you experienced it. They are in their own bubble and their own, like we've said, you know, before, like fish, you know, doesn't know about water. You just it's not unaware of it, which is a terrible thing. And it becomes clearer and clearer. And um, so, but what, what, what do you think could, could really help? What do you feel has to change? You know, what's interesting is I think at the, at the end of the day, every, the thing that um, the, 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 the protests are um, um, a, awakening or fueling is at the end of the day, it's all connected back to the same thing. Like, we it's trying to figure out how do we actually create an anti-racist society and also how do we really really make an assessment of how did we get here because even the people who have said that um you know even that they felt uh, in a way unaware um the 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 images and the um the messages have been have been here for so long. People have been fighting for freedom for 401 years in this country. Do you know what I mean? The, it's it's even it's funny now. Even sometimes as I'm just going through and just just reading different articles and stuff like that, I'm like, oh, actually, there's so many times where we're just echoing things that um, people said before. Where it's like we this is this is a moment where we are echoing James Baldwin, where we're echoing Audre Lorde, where we're echoing. W.E.B. Du Bois, where we're echoing Harriet Tubman, where we're echoing Frederick Douglass, you know, these are, it's the same messages that have been transformed. And it's really just about, um, especially for the white people in this country to really make the space to listen. People have been saying the same thing over and over again. It kind of reminds me of, um, um, you know, the way that we talk about, you um, you know, for people who are progressive, the way that we talk about the audience that is primarily focused on Fox News, for example, it's like I mean, there's a different. It's like it's like there's a different reality because people have been essentially lied to in order to make them think a certain way about a thing, and it's that same kind of balance I think between white America and Black America. It's like people have been lied to about who we as Black people are. Um, our role in the society, our capacity has been just 400 years of just actual lies about, um, about who we are. And so and now it's like, okay, are we willing as a society to really invest in dismantling all of those lies and all of the laws that have been produced because of um, because of those lies and all the laws that people are benefiting from because of those because of those lies because it's like the, it's so the it's in a way it's like even in spur inside of theater it's the same thing that's inside of the police department it's like things people just have to be able to make that commitment um, to um, to an anti racist agenda otherwise um, we won't we won't um, get it. we won't be able to get anywhere and i think it's it's incredible to have a moment of um you know where I, it's it's i mean it's insane that so many people are have are unemployed um and you know some uh, who knows when people will be able to get back to um back to work again um it's insane that it takes this level of um um, kind of agony and despair to be able to um, energize this conversation, but in a way, um, it's it, it 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 just can't be um, it can't be swept away. It's a li it's like you're just like this. It's really it's really something that in a moment where everything is meant to shut down, that the heartbeat of this um, terror is um, 
the, is, is like the loudest, it's the loudest thing. Cause it's like, it's, 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 it's the underbelly of, of everything. So um, I feel like that at the end of the day, it's like, it's as simple as um, what, what, is, what is the commitment that we're making to ourselves? Um, what is the work that the um, white um, Americans and citizens are willing to do um, to be in partnership in that mission? Um, and because, yeah, it's, 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 we, we have, we have been here before. And I think that, that um, it's going to be an exercise in the same way that for those of us who have been able to stay inside have been embarked on a mental exercise of how do we um, kind of maintain sanity and health and all of those things, are we going to be able to commit to the exercise of justice? Because, um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a long, it's going to be a long road. And if history has taught us anything, it's that we will a hundred percent make progress, but also the racist ideas are also going to find a way to make progress as well. So how do we continue to just chisel to kind of be able to balance it out? And I have no idea who knows what that looks like. I feel like I still have to continue to make space for myself to imagine what that um, dream is, what that possibility is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and this, this, this time of Corona for you as an artist, mm -hmm. um, in confinement, three months at home, yeah. as you said, you are also by yourself. Everybody thinks, oh, we, everybody's with, back with families and friends, but not, not everybody is. Um, and um, did it change something? Did it radicalize you? Did it something make more obvious than before? Or you, you felt, no, that was always like this. And uh, now it's just becoming clearer. Yeah, I think I think it's probably the um, I think it's probably the latter. Um, I think, I, I, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about um, here in the apartment is, um, yeah, how to continue to just be true to, um, you know, how, like, how do we continue to be true to um, who we are and honor um, who we are and be honest about the things that we want to um, change and ad adjust or learn. Um, so for me, it's been time to just um, reflect on, okay, these are the things that I have been doing. These are the things I want to do better. Um, these are in order to do those things better. These are the things I need to learn, address. Um, and in order to be the most true to myself and be able to move forward from that place of truth and honesty. And that's art, that's artistically, that's personally. Um, so it's been, um, it's been, um, I feel like I have, yeah, I very rarely make that space to just kind of like sit and have those um, conversations and reflections. So um, I have been grateful to be able to, um, to be able to do that. But the, in terms of the, the fight, the fight has always been there because this is just the, the world that we um, live in. We've always, we've always lived in this. We've always lived in this, in this place. Um, and it's now, it's like recalibrating how many people are living in the same place as you are. Hmm. Do you think in your work, it will have consequences these three months at home thinking or um, do you feel it's a, a reinforced of, of already what I did, and I want to be even, you know, you know uh, more more dedicated to that? So is that is there? Do you detect a change, perhaps also in form, and w w what you think about it when it comes to making theater? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I I definitely think it. I definitely think it has changed. And funnily enough, I don't. In a way, I don't feel like it has like changed me into a new person. I feel like it's actually just connected me back to um, certain of my original kind of like 
impulses and thoughts and you know what I mean? Because as I say, when as we think when we think about what it means to make theater, um, that that system, that very large system of the regional theaters and off Broadways want to say that theater looks and feels a certain way. And I just love that you had Tamla and James on um, the other day and that they were able to come on and talk about something like, like three fifths, which is to just everything they were saying was so true like where where is the space um um for that kind of work inside of you know the institutions that are producing the most um the 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 most money who have the most resources it makes sense that that was produced um and i am so sad i didn't get to see it but that it was produced um at 3ld and the imagination and the scope and the epicness and the dream of the thing that they created is so extraordinary and i think that um there's so many um incredible artists and other institutions that have been supporting um all different kinds of um all different kinds of work so i feel um yeah i feel i feel in a way just more connected and more excited to figure out how do we also kind of create new institutions, support the institutions that are there that can really hold on to the breadth of work. I mean, I think Siegel Center is definitely in that category and constantly thinking about, um, you know, what, what are all the different expressions of art that exists in the world and continuing to make space for artists to be in conversation about that um, and also have the platforms to um, invest, investigate that. I've certainly felt that. Mm -hmm. So, um, for you, how, how did you, you said you grew up in, in, in Jersey, and um, how, how did you have that dream? Why did you say, I am going to theater, but we're going to do theater in my life? What happened? Mm. Um, I think it was, it was a number of things um, and I have the worst memory. So I'm gonna, I always try and like pull up all the great details and some of them I'm just like, mm, can't remember. Um, but um, I, yes, yeah, so as I said, I grew up in New Jersey and I was actually really into um, film when I was younger. Um, and I would just like love to like take out the camcorder and make videos. And I really enjoyed just taking pictures and just kind of cap just capturing moments. Um, and, um, when I, so where, where I grew up in New Jersey is probably about 20 minutes away from, um, the McCarter theater in Princeton. And, um, we, when I was in eighth grade, we went to see a production. It was like, we went on a, there was like a student matinee of, um, Anna DeVere Smith's play, Twilight, 1992. And that play um was um a play where after the la riots in 1992 she went into la and did i don't know maybe 200 300 interviews with different people korean store owners um you know i think she might have even interviewed um I, what is she, she did like cornell west she did police officers she might have done reginald denny i mean i can't remember there's so many people that she had interviewed and, and then she had selected, um, I'm, I'm gonna say maybe like 20, um, and she performed them on the stage. And I remember watching that performance. And first of all, just being completely blown away because it was so um, virtuosic, like her, the, the, the technical capacity of, the, of, of her performance was so incredible. And then on top of that, you're listening to all of these incredible stories embodied through this extraordinary black woman. And, um, and then, and so it was the, the performance itself was completely riveting. I was just completely blown away. And then after the performance, um, Emily Mann um, was the, uh, who had directed that production came out and did a talk back. And so it's kind of this like, just great kind of connection in terms of what the work was and hearing her talk about it and what the role of the director had been in the process. Um, and that was incredible. But the thing that really, I think, clinched it for me was, this is all like in a day, it's hilarious, um, was after the performance, we went back to school and instead of, um, instead of going back to class, just like going into math, um, we ended up, they ended up splitting us into groups 
um, and it must have been amongst the middle school, I can't quite remember, um, they ended up splitting us up into groups and we ended up spending, I can't remember how long, maybe an hour, might have only been an hour, maybe two, um, talking about the play, but using the play as a way to talk about the kind of racial events that are happening in society and our own communities. And that, I think that part of it was the part that I was like, oh, I like, I understood what the both, both artistic possibility of theater was, but also what the kind of political and social um, possibility was as well, that you could have a piece of art that is talking about people's lives in this really beautiful, cool form that can also be a part of um, transforming how we talk as citizens and people um, in the world. Like the play gave us a vocabulary to, to continue the conversation around um, the ideas and themes of racial injustice. And so I was just like, wow, that's so incredible. And since then, if I, and it might be a story I make up in my head about how it all began, but um, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a story I think of when I think of like, how did it all kind of um, kick off? It was just the, the capacity, the possibility, the opportunities for um, empathy, but also like how badass she was as a performance. I was like, this is amazing. Um, and so, yeah, it all, it all kind of began, um, I think, there. That was, that was when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. Well, this is in a way also an answer. So theaters put up uh, play, you know, innovative work from, from, from artists of color related to mm -hmm. social political issues. It's supposed to be a great work of art, a great performance. Then there was a talk back, right? Uh, Richard Schechter said one of his manifestos he's writing was says, every performance now should be shown live on any computer screens and then you can go back to see them right away and every performance has to have a talk back you know so, so that <laughs> that so you had shown you talk back you went back to school so in the place where you lived or worked also it had an impact so um and it just shows that theater did something that perhaps even a film or a book or others it didn't didn't have that effect on you so this is a already a way of um, saying this something changed there and this is something where theater can make can make a contribution in, in your work as an artist um, what, what that complicated world we live in that complicated world for you to find a nest to you know create your work and your way to you know what, what what do you want to do with theater what is your your um, your your goal and um, why do you do theater? Mm, it's a great question. Um, I have to circle back and just catch one thing really quick, which is about talkbacks. Um, and what's so funny, because even though I appreciated that talkback so much, and I and I think actually student matinee talkbacks are always the best talkbacks, um, but regular talkbacks, especially when we're doing black plays for mostly white audiences are excruciating. And at this point, I also often say, let's not do them unless there is a person of color or someone who is very adept at managing thoughts and ideas around person of color leading the conversation because they inevitably go crazy wrong and they're just they end up being just the most sometimes racist conversations so well, tell, it's us a a real, tell us it's a real that. balance well i'll just say for any any black artist who's listening right now they totally understand because we've all been um <laughs> so you tortured. get it. So you get questions. Uh, tell us a bit. What do people say? The white audiences then to you? Or? Oh, oh yeah. No, P people. People ask. People ask. Really, I I'm trying to think of an example. I, I wish there were other people with me now because they would be able to jump in and give plenty of examples. But they they just inevitably, if you know, if we're doing a if we're doing a play with predominantly black actors, um, that's a black story, and we're doing it in front of a white audience, you know, they very oftentimes people will just ask dumb questions that just demean our um humanity and don't they just they even though people just don't have um um a vocabulary for talking about black life and so they just inevitably botch it up and then we end up being on the front lines of the firing squad figuring out how to negotiate it and how to um you know how to respond do we need to respond can we 
yell at the person? Can we argue with the person? What is that going to, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very complicated um, web. So um, yes, it's, 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 it's something very, I think just um, pervasive that all of us are very um, aware of. So, I mean, now, I mean, um, very oftentimes, and especially if the playwright is around too, we will be, we'll be very, very intentional about what the talkback's gonna be. And sometimes it's not necessarily a talkback. We can do a moderated conversation. Um, you know, we, 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 we figure, we, we try and figure it out, but they can be very difficult mm -hmm. and painful. But in a way um, you say, this is also why theaters fail, like the artists of color, not having a competent person there who protects them, who guides the conversation. Mm -hmm. This kind of a referee and shows a yellow card or you mm -hmm. know, and uh, or a timeout, um, and those, so that's a very, very important, important uh, um, note actually. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, but typically, I thought, I, I mean, it's always amazing to have the conversations with, with students after the matinees. I think they're always so, um, you know, those those can be a lot, a lot of fun. Um, but to your second question. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I feel um, very oftentimes as a director, I feel like my um, job and goal is to, um, especially if we're working on a new play, for example, to create a space where um, everybody can create the best work um, and kind of become the greatest version of themselves as an artist in the room so that we can create something um, just kind of magnificent and beautiful and thought provoking and, you know, whatever the, uh, um, purpose and function of the specific pieces to be. Um, but I think it's exciting that we get to continue to, on the one hand, think about what does it mean to tell stories? Um, in my case, mostly stories um, about Black people, about people of color, um, um, and to be able to share those stories with our audiences, um, to be able to create moments of connection. Um, that's kind of in the narrative zone of what, um, you know, making theater is, but also in another zone, um, creating um, just um, incredible experiences that capture a moment, that capture an idea, that capture a philosophy, that capture um, an emotion, that, and that create an experience that um, is exciting and unpredictable, and that connects you to the deepest part of yourself um, as an audience member. And who knows what that looks like? Who knows if there are 600 people in the audience for that? Who knows if there are three? Who knows if the piece moves around? Uh, I was joking, um, I was talking to Ashley um, Tata the other day. We were just, you know, talking about what it means to like, where are the places that we want to create? And um, where are the, who are the people that we want to um, to be there? So I think the, the conversation continues to kind of stretch wide and far, but I feel um, yeah, continually grateful to be in conversation and communi communion with artists as we kind of create moments of expression um, without any dictate of what that needs to look like or feel like. Mm. When you mentioned Anna de Smith, but what other artists um, influence you? Whose artists, what artists do you look up to? What artists were significant for your artistic development? Mm. Um, you know, I think often of um, someone like George Wolf, whose work I always loved as a director, because I feel like he, um, there's always such a, 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 a energy, just the, an immediacy to the work that he creates. And it's very um, transformative in the sense that it, um, it feels like it makes its own rules as to what it wants to be. Do you know what I mean? And he has such an energy and a vigor and um, um, for the work he creates. And you see that every moment of any production you see of his is totally and completely dynamic and purposeful. Um, so I feel like he has definitely been a huge influence. Um, and someone else who, when I was growing up, was a huge influence too, was um, um, uh, Julie Taymor. I think Lion King must have come out um, when I was in, I don't know, in high school at some point. But um, I had also been um, able to see, um, I don't, maybe like on PBS or something, some of her other pieces and the kind of the imagination and the scope of her work, I always thought was so um, exciting. And um, yeah, it was, it was so imag imaginative and, and epic, you know? Um, and um, I think about, um, 
actually even other art forms, um, Pedro Almodovar, <laughs> this is the poster behind my head, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is a uh, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown. And I remember, I remember seeing that though, and just the, the way that he um, used um, color in his film, kind of manifesting his vision of what real looked like in this totally vibrant, cool um, way. I was like, what is this? This is incredible. Um, so it, it went down a rabbit hole with um, his films as well. Um, and actually someone who um, I think about a lot now is um, a novelist, um, his name is Ben Oakry. And I think I actually have it here because I, I was pulling it up this morning, thinking about this conversation. Um, I'm just, I'm gonna read you a small thing, Frank. Mm -hmm. um, so Ben Oakry, he's a, he's a British Nigerian author and he wrote um, this incredible book called The Famished Road. Um, and it's so beautiful and it kind of um, tells a story in Nigeria that um, has, um, where he kind of um, juxtaposes or plays with the, the kind of the human world, but also with the spirit world and how those worlds are in conversation with one another, um, which kind of you know, fits into the tradition of Nigerian um, mythologies and cosmologies. Um, and reading his work also, um, the, the dream and the possibility that he um, explores has always been so exciting. And so this, this, this kind of section I wanna to read to you is a section that now, just for fun, because I think it's so amazing. I always read it at, like at the beginning of any process um, because it's so, um, I don't know, it's so um, energetic. But I'll, just, I'll just read you like a couple lines. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. He says, my wife, my son, where are we going? There is no rest for the soul. God is hungry for us to grow. When you look around and you see empty spaces, beware. In those spaces are cities, invisible civilizations, future histories, everything is here. We must look at the world with new eyes. We must look at ourselves differently. We are freer than we think. We haven't begun to live yet. The man whose light has come on in his head, in his dormant sun, can never be kept down or defeated. We can redream this world and make the dream real. Human beings are gods hidden from, our, from themselves. My son, our hunger can change the world, make it better, sweeter. People who use their, only their eyes do not see. People who use only their ears do not hear. And then it goes on and on in magnificence. But, um, but I think about that passage often. And even when we first went into um, our kind of lockdown, I just took that phrase, we can redream the world and make the dream real. And I'm staring because I just posted it up on um, my wall. And I think it's such a perfect um, um, kind of quote also for the moment, not to say that um, we shouldn't have to fight for um, justice, not to say that um, the fight is not gonna be hard and not, that we're not gonna have to kind of keep our eyes so specifically on the things that we are fighting for because it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna be a, a real fight as it has always been, but just that sense of um, what's the possibility of this moment without being naive to what the challenges are and what the historic precedent has been. Um, but also what's the, what's the possibility. So um, that's a thing I've been holding on to as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's very meaningful that in the invisible spaces, you know, that contains mm -hmm. future, future cities, future lives. And, uh, and to have that at your wall, when you hear outside the sirens and you don't know, is it a police car, is that an ambulance or someone who's gonna be brought to hospital is going to die? And they hear the yeah, voices yes. of demonstrators, you know, so this is yeah. uh, uh, um, quite a time. And, um, and um, I think it's a, it's a good, it's a very important quote, what you have there. And then really thank you for sharing. And I really do hope that uh, this time is a time that will uh, 
will bring change. I know you had that fantastic project of Black Classics, right? Um, yeah. And so t tell us, but did, did you, were you able to do those, to direct those, and how did you select those? Yeah, so, um, so yes, we did um, this series and the, for the first round was at the Siegel Center. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been so incredible. Um, the, um, we have been Tell a bit about the idea. Yeah, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, it's how it started, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so the idea behind the play classic, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's basically the idea is that um, when we think of the classical canon, um, that there are a lot of plays and a lot of playwrights who have been um, systematically left out of what that canon is. Um, and so in a way, what we think of the canon is not the canon because it's not, it's incomplete because it doesn't include um, a litany of, of black artists. So um, the idea behind classics is to um, bring the um, to expand our notion of what the classical canon is by investigating and exploring plays by black playwrights. And we're defining classics as plays that um, were written before, um, I think we've said 1990, um, and, and really thinking about uh, the definition of a classic as a play that was written in a certain time that resonates, um, which, which themes resonate with our own. So it's been a great adventure. I mean, from the four plays that we did, um, gosh, that was maybe two or three years now, yeah, Frank. Yeah. Um, um, we've been able to do those four plays and it's really expanded and I'm, I'm so They were all produced? They all became produced, the plays? We haven't produced them all. We did, um, we did a- Maybe tell um, our listeners the plays. What are the plays um, mm. you, you selected? Yeah, so it's so interesting. This, this really all started because I was assistant directing on a production of Shuffle Along that was on Broadway that George Wolfe was directing. And he, he is the one who mentioned, he said, have you ever read these plays? One was by a man named Bill Gunn, named The Forbidden City. And then the other was by a woman named Kathleen Collins that's called The Brothers. Um, and I hadn't read the plays, I'd never heard of those writers before. And so I went out looking for the plays, couldn't find the plays. Um, and so we put the series together um, as a reading series to explore the plays. So we did those two plays, The Forbidden City, we did the Alice Childress play, Wine in the Wilderness. Um, we did Ron Milner's play, What the Wine Sellers Buy. And then we closed it out with Kathleen Collins's play, um, The Brothers. Um, and since then, um, last year, we were in conversation with Juilliard. And so Juilliard did a production of The Forbidden City with its students. And for us, you know, we kind of think about there's four um, pillars. But actually, before I get there, I should say the team now has really expanded. Um, and so we, the team now includes um, AJ Muhammad, who's an incredible producer and dramaturg. He's one of the producers on the Fire This Time Festival. He's also a researcher at the Schomburg. Um, a brilliant dramaturg um, named Arminda Thomas, who's such a fantastic, I mean, completely amazing, also historian of black theater and black art. Um, um, Dominique Ryder, who is a um, director um, and just uh, such a, a, a light and enthusiast of, um, of, of black art and, and black theater and black history. Um, and then lastly, Brittany Bradford, who's an actor and also a producer who um, is also so committed and is just so um, inventive and smart and thorough. So we've kind of grown and expanded um, since that time. Um, and we're able to do another reading of an Alice Children's play at Tafana in, um, in February, right before everything shut down, which very ironically enough was a play that took place in 1918 during the 1918, um, epi the 1918 epidemic. So um, really? yes, yeah, um, it's a brilliant play. Um, um, called Wedding Band that Alice Childress wrote. But the, when we think about the kind of the pillars of what classics is, um, there are four of them. One is to um, kind of continue to do readings of the plays, which are um, just a great way to get people together and explore them and get them out in the, in the open, let people know that they're um, 
what they are and kind of what their histories are. Um, the second component is to um, get the plays into production in um, theaters around the country and around the world. Um, a third component is um, what we call the education and also the narrative component, meaning, um, as I say, when I was in college, um, I didn't read, maybe I read one black play, I can't remember. I think students now obviously are reading Dominique and they're reading Katori and they're reading, you know, Terrell and, you know, and Lynn and so many incredible um, contemporary playwrights are part of the curriculum. Um, and I mean, and of course, August Wilson and Lorraine Hansberry. Um, and, um, but making sure to get these other plays into um, the teaching and the learning so that when we're learning about what theater is, we're not learning it without including um, Adrian Kennedy. We're not learning it without learning um, Bill Gunn, you know? Um, so that's another major component. And then the, um, and the narrative component is how do we continue to kind of get um, the information around the plays and the playwrights out into the world. Um, and then the last pillar is um, public, publication. So, you know, some of these plays, as I say, even after George mentioned those two plays and I went out to look for them, you know, there's only one copy of um, The Forbidden City in New York. And it's, you know, actually I met somebody, a great guy who runs the Metrograph Theater, um, um, Jacob Perlin, and he has done such incredible work around the film work of Bill Gunn um, and has also kind of created a kind of small archive of, of Bill Gunn's plays as well. But um, the plays are very hard to find. Um, yeah, and so, I remember and, it wasn't easy, you know, when we did it, so you, <laughs> you were really going around saying, I don't know where it is and uh, it took a while, yeah. Yeah, totally. And then scan, scanning all the pages, you know, making copies in the library and scanning. So the last component is the plays that are really hard to find, um, you know, figuring out who has the rights to some of these plays, which is also its own adventure, um, and then getting the plays published so that we can get them out into the world. Um, a little bit easier. So um, yeah, so we, we have a really extraordinary group of people um, who have come together to um, kind of keep that mission going forward, but it's exciting. And what's great is that we're always just learning new things and learning new plays. And like, you know, it's great having, you know, AJ and Arminda on the team too, because they, they will just pop up with like an article from, you know, 1898 about some great play or great performance or, you know, a great piece of writing. Um, so it's been, it's been really beautiful. And the other component that we really want to make sure to include is plays um, from outside of the United States so that, you know, we're including plays by M.A. Césaire and Soyinka and Amata Edu and thinking about what are also our Black storytelling traditions that might not look like what we think of now as a play, but that are really kind of at the roots of um, the kind of manifestation and growth of what theater is, what ritual performance is, what community um, um, celebration looks like. And so including um, plays inside of the, our kind of more ancient traditions inside of our catalog of the classical canon as well. Yeah, maybe we should do uh, as Siegel said, a publishing project. We are open for business if yes. we want to put the analogy. Why not? Let's do that uh, together. And I was easily saying that we could do that. I'm, I want to uh, reach out to you and say that officially. And yeah. I can take it back. Other people heard it. And but uh, we, at the time, we put one. But listen, Aboye, you did such great work. And I also remember that beautiful feast you directed uh, with us, the uh, Yoruba musical that came out of. Um, of the National Theater and the Royal Court in London. We tried to get it to people in New York. Nobody was interested. It's such yeah. a beautiful work with five writers over five centuries, the dance yeah. and music. If there's ever something is a musical component that should have been done in New York, it's shocking that nobody was interested. And this came from the National Theater in London. It's not even had, you know, had a good business card on its side. And it just shows, you know, there are barriers. Um, it's impossible to, um, to 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 get through. But you, you, we have so much respect for you and for your work, and really, um, and thank you for sharing. And I think that quote is a really beautiful. Send send it to us. So we'll put it up on our website um, under <laughs> under um, um, the talk um, of today. And um, and you know, keep on the work. I, nothing lasts forever. 
not the good things, but also not the bad things. So this will be over uh, one day and it's good to take the time to prepare as a, maybe as a closing question, since we are coming to an end, um, to the young avoyers out there who are still maybe at Ohio. So interestingly enough, Adrian Kelly, yes. the Ohio <laughs> State murders, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And when she exactly. writes how terrible she felt yeah. studying in Ohio, that it was the worst yeah. time in her life, how yeah. she felt ignored. Um, at university and often actually yeah mentioned also white women often you know mm -hmm. who were the worst the white girls um, but anyway so a lot has happened and we shouldn't ignore it but there is a line of history actually also an incredible work the ohio state murders mm -hmm. um, we try to, to to stage it uh, or part of it at adrian kennedy evening um this uh, also was Anne catanio from lincoln center theater and uh, mm -hmm. And others, uh, but it, of course, it didn't happen this uh, this uh, this spring. We did wanted to do the pen world voices, but um, what what do you say? What do you say is of significance? Is of importance? What should we focus on? Maybe to now to say the white audience or the, the artists to all of what what do you say to us? Pay attention to that. That is meaningful. Mm. In a way, I'll actually almost um, um, flip it around a little, Frank, and I would say um, the thing that I'm, one of the things I'm really excited about is for us as Black artists to um, come together in our um, kind of, in all the power and brilliance that exists inside of the Black theater community and continue to create um, new pathways and to continue to support the pathways that exist for ourselves inside of our institutions and to continue to, as the um, great Camilla Forbes, who I was speaking to the other day, mentioned about what it means to go toward where the love is and um, continue to make the, do the, make, fight the fights that we have to fight inside of the white institutions, but also kind of live inside of the greatness and the power of the black institutions and the black artists. And I, I feel like our possibility and capacity is just um, limitless. I feel like we stand on the shoulders of giants um, and our um, ancestors speak and live through us in every single moment. And I feel, um, yeah, I feel very um, present and I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like I like it's us, up to us to be true. And I think that's where all of these movements are coming from is that sense of like, we know, we know that we are powerful. We know that we are strong and any um, body, any person, any of the systems that seek to negate that um, all have to come down because um, we, we just can't go, we can't go forward. So I, I look forward to that kind of continued fight and collaboration um, and in power. Um, and we'll see what the next day brings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And to look at those in, invisible spaces, as you say, and, and, and the stage I do think is uh, one of those uh, spaces that um, helps us to communicate, you know, something between the living and the dead. Jan Kot said that, but also between the present, the past, mm -hmm. and the future. And um, something appears on the stage and it goes beyond what it only is about. It stands for um, so much more and uh, in the symbolic way, in an imaginary way, and also mm -hmm. in a real way. And uh, we need to see that change. And if we don't do it in the theater, world and performance world, who else will? So this is of real significant uh, um, importance. I remember when Tom Pinklepearl took over Commissioner of the Arts, he mm -hmm. came out of the Queens Museum, he did such great community work and he did a study how, how was the distribution. I think there were 2% were non-white in the, in, the, uh, yeah. in the office, 2 in New yeah. York City. That's right. What does that mean? People decide what to do. Two percent, you know, and uh, the majority yeah. of New York City is no longer white, you know, since I think yeah. it turned five, six years ago. Officially, without even the unofficial count, you know, we hear mm -hmm. 160 languages on the street. They are not reflected. We don't see them. We don't hear the stories. There are no subtitles in in Spanish. You know, like the mm -hmm. Gorky Theater in Berlin. They, every show has Turkish subtitles. They said this is our audience too. They don't all speak so great German, but we want them. They are important. And maybe that will help yeah. them to feel more at home, to create, as Jean-Luc Nancy said yesterday, some kind of a belonging, a Heimat, uh, uh, um, 
a place where you inhabit, you don't just visit like a tourist and go back, but where you spend time and, um, and mm -hmm. where you uh, engage. And you're mm -hmm. one of those uh, workers. So really, uh, well, yes, thank mm -hmm. you for, for, for joining us. Keep on your great and work. And let me just mm -hmm. think, Frank, Chris, very quickly to that point that you just made is, um, is about like, as we, because we, we, we recognize the injustice of that thing in the present, but also what does it mean for us to go back in time and look at the places when the NEA was formed in the 60s? What are the ways that that money didn't go to black artists? What are the ways that someone had to come into the NEA and say, actually, we need to allocate those sources. And then there's a moment of progress. And then what does that mean for the Reagan administration to have come in and cut that section of the NEA out? It's like all of these things are so, and that's the thing that's like this, this systemic part of it that's beyond, this is the way it should be. It's like, how do we get rid of the systems that have actually put this imbalance into place? Because that, I mean, that funding statistic is, is crazy. It is crazy how so how little it is. Uh, it's less yeah. than one theater in Berlin with the, for the entire different forms of the arts. It's like it's 160 million. I think the Schaubühne mm. Berlin has 300 yeah. million. Uh, yeah. um, and then also, I mean, on the other hand, there's perhaps even more money in the US around for the arts, it gets supported from museums and orchestras, so many, many things in a great way. And we also like that. But the big difference is artists in other countries they are part of the decision makers institutions are run by artists they're not run by you know people who started arts administration or come from finance uh, it's not run by people on who are on the board because they donated money and they can't do that no that artists are in charge and they have a different awareness and i think what's also missing is that connection that artists are at the table have a place at the table all artists but especially artists um, of color, you try to get a free rehearsal space anywhere on the big institutions and you go to MoMA or the Met or uh, others and say, I would like to rehearse my show there. If you see, you will not get it or you will have to pay an enormous amount of money, you know? And so, but he still, they got at least some support. So something is wrong in the distribution and, and, um, and of, of everything. And I hope this moment also will serve as a, as a, we say, as a shake up and as a, trembling earthquake and that's this uh, uh, Fukushima uh, meltdown yes. what we have now and Richard Schechner always goes the friend of his said you know but we look into the reactor the roof is blown open it's a catastrophe we now see everything that virus has exposed what already is out there it's a catalyst that brought it together so I hope it will it will bring change also good change but we have to work for it and fight for it and i i really want to applaud you for what you did and what you're going to do and um, and uh, congratulations and uh, and uh, we our um, listeners uh, thank you for listening we also went a little bit about time again tomorrow we have woody king jr who i think 50 years he had a new federal what did what did he learn in that time what did he do what did he go through? What does he think about the time? No, I can't wait to hear uh, from Woody. Uh, I know he's a legend in his field also, and what he's continued to be working, but also his overview. And um, and then we are working on the lineup for next week. It's all together, but I think Peter Schumann from the great Bread and Puppet Theater, who has done a great work in political theater, work with puppets, put it socially engaged theater out there in Vermont. Tanya Bruguera, a significant artist from Cuba, who also does performance and performance work um, as part of her um, uh, her outreach and uh, in the community work um, and uh, and uh, many many others from Malaysia and from uh, from uh, I think from uh, Netherlands and Iran and uh, and uh, Hope Zeta from Rwanda. So it's also going to be again a mosaic from uh, uh, from uh, the artists and fellows around uh, um, around the work. So um, so I uh, look forward to next week's. Thank you guys for listening all and listening in. This has been a long time. It's week 11. Next uh, week will be week 12 where we talk every day. Um, and I feel it's an important that we do listen and that we know what's going on, that we see the world, how it really is, and then wake work on how we want it to be. And uh, so this is important to have you listening and supporting um, our, our artists. And hopefully it also contributes a little bit to your day in this time of uh, Corona. Thanks to HowlRound for hosting us every day. Uh, 
Sia and uh, Vijay and Travis to Sun Yang and Andy at the Siegel team and uh, Avoya. All the best and uh, I hope all the stuff you're working now on will, will see the light. This 